Episode of Headphones Neil Reviews. I'm your host, as always, Headphones Neil, with a more of a catch up episode than anything, um, just because I didn't have a chance to watch everything I wanted and I sidetracked myself with another film franchise. So I thought I would do a review based on just that. So after last week's episode, I got to thinking that um, I just thought whatever I had been watching, in case I missed anything on my flight back from India or anything like that and I remember that I did watch um, the Fast and the Furious the first film in the Fast and Furious franchise and so I got to thinking um, let me watch some of the other films and kind of see what would make for a complete um, shows or set of movies order things like that Um, so I ended up watching all of the films except or all the films through Fast 7 um, I skipped Tokyo Drift partly because in general it's a more of a side story than anything else and it except for the whole part with Han um, most of the film doesn't really fit in with the rest of the franchise and I'm skipping um, 8 and 9 just because that kind of takes the franchise into a different direction because they start expanding into the peripheral of stuff where you have an unknown brother or unknown Toretto brother. Um, you bring in a couple of the guys from Tokyo Drift to make a rocket cannon to kind of not leave them out. So for me, watching the first two Fast and the Furious films, then watching four, five, six, and seven is actually a very complete story, mostly because it ends on the note of um, in one of the films, Letty dies. And then by the end of the seventh film, um, they found her, found out that she's alive and they help her get her memory back and remember that she and Dom had gotten married and rebuilt their relationship and their love for each other. So, And then it also rounds it out as far as um, Paul Walker passing away and ending the franchise there. So for me, all in all, if you want to watch the Fast and the Furious films and have a complete story based on the original cast members then that's kind of what you can do is you know watch one two four five six and seven and you got a complete story um the Hobbs and Shaw film also on the side um is also one of those things where it's not a bad movie I also like um Fast 8 and 9 so and also Tokyo Drift for that matter so don't get me wrong in saying that and thinking that I don't like the films I liked all of them but as far as just a um, story as far as the original cast goes then that's kind of the films that I would say are the must watch films um, and also nothing against having another Toretto brother it would have been one of those things that's actually nice to um, have talked about I know there was a line by Mia in one of the films that she doesn't want the family broken up again but in retrospect it would have been nice if the line would have been something like I don't want to lose another brother and keep that a vague um, comment so that when they bring in um, John Cena as the unknown brother that that actually makes sense and it kind of fills in that little uh, loophole in the story unknown comment and that sort of stuff so um, that's kind of all I'm gonna say for that Um, it's kind of one of those things where it's like you know you have a watch order for the Star Wars films so when you're watching the fast films those are kind of the movies to definitely watch and you actually don't have to mess around with the order you can watch them in um, order and get through them as far as the whole thing with Tokyo Drift and Han um, I think after the fourth or fifth movie he actually says that he wants to go to Tokyo this is I want to say before he meets Giselle Um, they do talk he does talk about going to Tokyo again with Giselle Um, I forget if he says um, he wants to go back or he wants to go he just says he wants to go there so it's one of those things where 
in any case, at any point in the when you're watching films four through seven, as long as it's before the seventh one, then you can watch Tokyo Drift. But definitely after the first time he says he wants to, he's gonna go to Tokyo, which I think is after the fourth Fast Four. Um, then watch Tokyo Drift, and everything makes sense as far as that goes. So with that being said, I'm gonna move on to this week's Android tip. So in this case, I'm gonna talk about. Um, using a custom launcher to um, simplify, manage, have an easy to use, have a minimalist layout sort of thing. And this is actually going to be part one of two of this particular tip because I do have, or I do have an update for next week as far as the um, another launcher that recently got a major update for Android 14 and theming and things like that. So that's for next week. But for this week, there is a launcher or a couple of launchers made by the same developer on the Google Play Store. The free one is called O Launcher and the paid one is called Pro Launcher. And what the, they aim to do is create a minimalist home screen that is not cluttered by pages and icon packs and um, icons and widgets and all of this sort of different stuff where now all of a sudden it's detrimental to navigate your home screen because you don't know where um, any of your apps are. Um, you're, you have all these widgets that are um, taking up screen real estate, bogging down resources, um, you know, slowing down your device speed, um, not necessarily your internet speed, but when you have all these um, apps that are you know, having to refresh in the background, it does take resources and things like that. So what O Launcher and Pro Launcher aim to do is create a more minimalist um, UI for your home screen. So you just have a set of shortcut apps. So, you know, think of it like your frequently used apps. So if you have, you know, two, three, seven apps that you always use, you set them on your home screen so they're easy to use. And then you um, swipe up on your home screen and you can say, okay, well, here's the rest of the app. So if I need to get to something else, then they're all there. And all the apps in the app drawer are automatically alphabetized. So as you're navigating through the list of all your apps, um, all you really need to know is the name of the um, app you're looking for. So Amazon shows up right at the top, YouTube shows up all the way down at the bottom. So you know exactly how far you need to scroll when you're navigating through your apps. So the benefit of these launchers is it makes this navigation that much more easy, smooth, um, and lightweight, which is another benefit of the launcher is that because there's no, like an O launcher, there's no widget support. So it's a super lightweight launcher. It, the navigation's a breeze. And now because you don't have all this stuff um, updating in the background, um, it doesn't mean if you have a lot of apps, that's not gonna solve it. But if you don't have all these widgets, um, of um, refreshing in the background, now all of a sudden your phone has more system resources available, you know, battery life improves and um, it's easy to get in and out of things you need to do while using your phone. Um, one of the benefits of using Pro Launcher is, as I mentioned, it does include, or I, not that I, or I sub, subtly mentioned is, um, Pro Launcher does have support for widgets, but not in the sense that you create multiple pages for overflow in case you have big widgets, small widgets, or anything like that, it has a single page to the left of for your widgets. You instead of having you know five pages or two pages for widgets, it has one to the left. So you swipe left to right and you add all your widgets, whatever the size of them is. You can resize them and then you scroll up and down to navigate through those pages or through the page to access all of your widgets. So now all of a sudden your um, home screen is that much more organized. It's, you can um, order your widgets in the way you want. So it's easy for you to um, get to them and you don't have to worry about um, having to find the thing you're looking for because it's all in one place. It's in the order that works best for you. So if you want, you know, your Chrome bookmarks first, then your weather widget and then your steps widget, you can do that if you want weather steps and then bookmarks or you know, YouTube, Spotify, and then Pocket Cast, whatever, you know, whatever combination of widgets you want, you can put it there and put it in the order that works best for you. So um, Pro Launcher and O Launcher aim to help you create a very minimalist um, home screen and then also have a lightweight launcher that 
doesn't take up resources, it's not bogged down by um, all these different features, which is not necessarily a bad thing, which is going to come into my review for next week. Um, but it does it something where if you're one of those people that doesn't really worry about all these extra features on your home screen, then um, Pro Launcher and um, O Launcher give you the bare, a bare bones launcher that lets you get into what you want to do and out of what you want to do really fast, really easy, and not waste time and resources to do that. So both are available on the Google Play Store. Um, o Launcher, as I mentioned, is free. Pro Launcher has, I think, a uh, limited time free off usage, and then there's it's supported by um, a monthly subscription or a lifetime subscription. So if you want to make recurring payments to help support the developer, you can do that. Or if you want to make a one-time purchase of the app, then when I bought it, it was around, I think, $34, $35. So um, that, it's up to you whichever way you want to do, but the developer is super responsive. There's a Telegram group. So um, if you want to give feedback, share your home screen, um, if you have bugs or issues, um, if you want to learn a little bit about the roadmap of what features are in the work, uh, recommend features, um, things like that, then you can join that group, get feedback from others in the community who may have, may or may not have had the same issue, um, get feedback from the developer himself as far as um, how to fix it, resolve it, known issues, uh, if, if you found a new issue, things like that. So definitely worth checking out there. Now, finally, to round out this particular episode, I've um, had a chance to finish playing Max Payne. So as of this recording, my gameplay for it is now complete. I finished the game. Um, Max Payne is taken into custody and um, he um, expects, if well, if you haven't played the second one, um, you do. Ex he is expecting Alfred Woden to release him from police custody, which um, inevitably he does. But um, overall, for me, the game definitely stands up as far as being a film noir type video game. It definitely benefits from the voice overlay of Max Payne and his thoughts, the comic book style um, interlay and interstitials between levels and between certain aspects in the game so as you play the game it does stand out after all these years as far as gameplay goes and storytelling and all of that sort of stuff so um if you've never played the game i definitely recommend playing it the one thing that does stand out as not having stood the test of time is the graphics so one of the things at the time that was um, a particular uh, that was kind of funny and kind of a side joke was Max Payne's face in the game throughout the game. Like I want to say it was kind of like he's he had to like he had a um, taking a poop face or a, a permanent scowl or something like that, which the developers could never get around as far as solving that. But they did fix that in the second game, so um, it's one of those things where it was a problem with the develop like the abilities of the time, but. Um, if anything, like if all the talks of this Max Payne remake are true, that's one of the things that I, or the only thing that they hopefully fix when they're remaking the game that is um, fix the graphics, upscale them, uh, get rid of all the blockiness, uh, fix some of the character models so the hands um, look less blocky, the buildings are more rounded and modern, add better graphics for the cars and the wheels as they're um, driving and things like that. And that's really all they really need, all they need to fix. Because even when you're playing the game, the models and gameplay in the game are actually super, are really, really good. And after all these years, like opening doors and things are a little bit clunky, but not terrible to the point where it's unplayable. Um, it's one of those things where once you get used to um, the like how that interaction is is supposed to be, then um, you don't really have fall into that trap too much else um or too many more times after that because you kind of know what you have to do so i mean even if they work on remaking and updating the graphics then it becomes one of those things where um the, uh, it feels like it would it would kind of i know it's going to sound simplistic to say if they fix the graphics and it would fix that problem of you know opening doors and selecting items and stuff but it kind of would be a related item is like maybe that's the only gameplay gameplay element to fix 
It doesn't really need fixing, but it would be improved just to make it easier to, you know, open doors, touch stuff, and have a little bit more granular control to kind of, you know, f update that, fix that, and make that a little bit more um, modern with the times. But for overall, it's not a terrible system, so you don't really realize how good or bad it is because it's not that terrible. So. Um, hopefully they do remake it and update the graphics a little bit, but overall playing it now, I still enjoy the game. I enjoy the storytelling, voiceovers, um, overall story with all the different characters with, uh, you know, Don Punchinello, Lupino, the integration of North mythology with the Valkyr drug and all of that. Um, the inner circle later on in the green game and all of that stuff. So overall still holds up as a game. Um, and it still works on Android devices, so the better the device or more modern the device, the better it'll play. And if you have a, you know, a modern flagship device um, like a OnePlus 9 Pro or OnePlus 10 Pro or new or a Galaxy S like 23 or 24, whatever they're up to and whatever they made in the past couple of years, I assume it'll work well on a recent-ish uh, Pixel device as well. So it's one of those things where um, um, it plays well and you can set all the graphics and uh, functions to maximum and play the game. So the gameplay that you see up on the YouTube channel is all the settings set at maximum. So um, you should be able to play it pretty easily. Um, I did play it with the Razer Kishi V2. So um, that's one of those things that definitely helps as far as the dream sequences in the game. So I think the last time I played it a couple of years ago, I was playing with the Kishi V1. Um, which made it hard to navigate some of those dream sequences, but um, playing it now with the V2 was much easier and I got through it a lot better than I was able to. So this gameplay for 2024 is a um, complete gameplay with all the um, dream sequences, didn't skip any levels, didn't use any cheats like God mode or anything like that. So all gameplay is as is. Um, and playing the game so the link will be in the show notes um for that gameplay so you guys can check it out for yourself but they're all up on the youtube channel um so if you want to look out for all my gameplay videos um podcast episodes on the youtube for the youtube version that's all on the channel at youtube.com slash the tell n01 the website is headphones reviews for uh, subscription links, past episodes, uh, supporting the show and all of that good stuff. Uh, supporters on the Patreon at patreon.com slash pateln01. Get early access to content and ad-free version of the show and all of that stuff. Um, I know I said I was going to watch the Marvels this week, but because I decided to start watching all the Fast and Furious films, I kind of put that off to the side, so look out for that next week. I didn't start watching Vikings Season 6 yet, so that's also on the queue. Um, now that Max Payne is done, um, depending on when you hear this episode, I'll start putting up some gameplay links for um, Doom Delta, the pre-release version of Doom, where um, a modder integrated a bunch of the um, assets from the pre-release version of the game into the do final Doom game. So I'm going to kind of play that and see how it goes and see how it stands up as far as some of those um, elements and weapons and things like that. I don't know if I'm going to play the whole game with it or just maybe the first episode. Um, but I'm going to kind of see how it is and how it um, holds up with the pre-release stuff and the new stuff. I did some early testing to make sure it works. And it seems... Um, okay, it doesn't really change the story too much. It just add, it adds some weapons, element, um, design elements, and things like that. So um, I'll probably play it under that like assumption that, okay, this is a pre-release version, so let's see how it looks with some of these elements that didn't quite make it into the game or something like that. Um, if it doesn't seem too interesting after the first couple of levels, then I'll probably just stop that and move into the Knights of the Old Republic gameplay. But... Um, if anything, like I said, I'll finish the first episode and just see how it goes from there. So with that being said, that's all for this particular episode. So um, if you have any questions, comments, feedback, or anything like that, um, you can comment on the post on this, any of the social media networks I am on. Um, support the show. Thank you for the subscription, all of that good stuff. Website again is headphonesneal.reviews. 
But thanks for tuning into this particular episode, and until next.